must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support, and now for the show. All right. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Brandon Pollan, and of course, as always, I am joined by my fellow co-hosts, F. Scott Thiel and Stephanie Wyrock. And today, we're actually going to be talking with two physical therapists to talk about their online mentorship program that they've developed to really help clinicians really successfully integrate the biopsychosocial model and really an understanding of evidence-based mechanisms behind the things that we do on a day-to-day basis to help our patients. So with that, I am pleased to welcome Dr. Mark Cardler and Dr. Jared Hall. You know, guys, but let's start off with a little bit more background of who you guys are because with the perspectives and what you guys do now, I'm sure that that didn't happen overnight. And I'm sure there's been a lot of things that happened since you've graduated from school to kind of your understanding of where you are. So let's, let's dive into a little bit of kind of a little bit more about you guys and kind of how you've gotten to where you guys are today since PT school. Sure. I mean, I'll start first, I guess. Um, I graduated PT school in 2003. And at that time I came out, I had a really top notch manual therapy instructor, Dan Vaughn in Grand Valley State. I'll give Dan a shout out because he's uh, actually past editor of JMMT, but a really great manual therapist and really opened my eyes to looking broadly at manual therapy and incorporating it without getting too dogmatic at one approach. So that was my pursuit in physical therapy throughout my career really was to, I thought the key and solution to helping people that I was struggling with in clinicals and as early in my career as a PT was I just needed to to develop these hands that were going to be able to feel what I needed to feel that was going to, you know, kind of unlock this mystery of some of these patients that we were seeing. And I think we all have these patients walking through our clinics each day that just don't fit that black and white textbook that we're taught in PT school, which is okay. Um, that's where critical thinking and clinical reasoning come in, of course. But I, I got certifications and my transitional DPT and uh, more certifications, did more manual therapy. Yet, and I got to a point where I was ready to just hang it up. I felt like I can't convince myself that I'm feeling the things that a lot of my instructors were telling me and my colleagues. It just didn't make sense. And um, yeah, so I was on the verge of quitting. I actually had my, uh, I was getting ready to take my MCAT and, and apply to, to DO school at Michigan State. Um, and then I can't remember how it all happened, but I ended up kind of stumbling upon Evidence in Motions Fellowship and kind of was talked to a few people and they're like, yeah, this is, isn't about the, the guru hands thing. It's more about, you know, evidence-based practice, which I was definitely down with. And that was really kind of the biggest, you know, really when in Sackett's work was really huge. Is It's still huge, but I think it's been a little bit more tempered, I think, as we've kind of recognized some of the limitations of a strict evidence approach. But I uh, got into Evidence and Motions Fellowship, and that was a great experience, really sharpened my critical thinking and clinical reasoning skills. But uh, even in fellowship training with mentorship, I still saw the same darn patients failing that I was in fellowship to figure out how not to fail with. And it was kind of a frustrating, kind of just destabilizing experience and until I had a pain science course. And then that really was a huge aha for me. It was like, wow, that makes sense why those people you can't put your fingers on their pain and you can't change their pain through your fingers there's a lot more going on than what we think is going on just at the tissue level where we're making contact with our touch so um that was a huge uh you know moment and really trajectory changer for my career that's where my passion has lied since as far as how do we better incorporate and understand this stuff to help people because i was seeing people that previously couldn't do anything for or struggled mightily to that all of a sudden we're making sense and we're able to start helping some of these 
really challenging cases in clinics. So um, I was fortunate enough to stay on an evidence in motion and teach for them in their clinical reasoning and pain science curriculum for a bit. And then um, was also lucky to come on or help transition Adrian's uh, Adrian Lowe's coursework onto evidence in motions uh, online learning module, his therapeutic pain specialist program. I was fortunate to take that program through Adrian and uh, lucky enough to stay on and teach a little bit with Adrian's group, but uh, decided I just wanted to have a message that taught the way I want to teach it, how I want to teach it, delivered in the medium I wanted to deliver it. Um, I have nothing but respect and gratitude for Adrian's group and uh, evidence in motion, and, but created modern pain care. And here we are a couple of years later, and I, I'm excited about the stuff we're doing and fired up for the future. Yeah, Mark, I'm curious how maybe you saw some of your, you mentioned Adrian Lowe and and we've had him on the show before and there's a lot of great minds and and mentors throughout the EIM programs, but Mm -hmm. how, how did you have some of those uh, mentors really influence you when going through fellowship? What were some of the things that they did that really helped change some of your views and the way that you, you progress through the fellowship program? You know, I think the big things that uh, would be critical thinking, clinical reasoning, as far as, you know, really this whole, I didn't really have any idea what metacognition was. And it's basically you're analyzing your own thinking. Um, But I never really took that step back and took a 10,000 foot view of like my thinking and reasoning throughout a patient care episode. So um, I had uh, great mentors, Tim Ferrand's uh, an amazing clinician here in Phoenix, who's really helped me sharpen some of my clinical reasoning skills and critical thinking skills. Um, I had, you know, quite a few different men, Andrew uh, Bennett, and was able to just pick the brains of, you know, Tim Flynn and John Childs. I think just the, the big thing is holding themselves up to, you know, being humble in front of a patient and being able to make it be about the patient and um, really, you know, thinking and and being willing to be wrong and being okay to be wrong and but being having yourself a process to to validate what you're saying and what you're doing in front of a patient was was a huge thing for me and still remains that way it's it's changed a lot a little well a bit since i've really incorporated pain science because my reasoning has expanded a lot more but uh, that was a huge part of the what you see with the mentors and they're just master communicators really i think we think it's all technical but there's just there's this whole patient human interaction thing that you watch these master clinicians do and it's it's amazing to watch and it's it's something to learn and, and emulate and i was fortunate to to be in front of some great ones yeah and I, i'm curious jared i know you've probably taken a little bit of a different path in your development because i know you're only out a few years talk a little bit about your journey man and kind of how you've gotten to where you are now yeah so i have a a, a similar but definitely much abbreviated story to mark um <laughs> I was one of those guys who, when I went into school, I was 100% uh, focused on becoming an outpatient sports manual therapy, physical therapist. I knew that that's what I wanted from the second that I got into school. As I was going through school, I focused all of my time and energy on learning more and more manual therapy when I was in school. I I was taking additional manipulation courses and I was taking kinesio taping courses and I was able to sit in on some of the early kinetocore courses. I I think I took uh, the level one dry needling course three times as a student (laughs) when, when I was going through my program because my program was a host site for their course. So of course I always volunteered to open up and close up shop and everything. And then, you know, when I graduated, I, I, I sought out, uh, a position that would offer me a lot of continuing education that had a big continuing education bonus and um, had a lot of courses that were hosted through that that company from the ISPI with Adrian Lowe. And at that time, I had no idea what the ISPI was. I had no idea who Adrian Lowe was. I was uh, just trying to learn as much manipulation and dry needling and, and uh, you know, instrument assisted work as I possibly could, because in my mind, that was, that was what I needed. That's what I was lacking from my curriculum. And that's what was going to make me a really skilled clinician. And uh, the very first weekend after I graduated, before I Uh, started my first job, I was able to take a class with Adrian Lowe. And it's kind of fitting that we're talking about this because I made a Facebook post on this topic a couple of days ago that that course, the week before I actually even started working as a clinician, 
I was able to uh, have a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with Adrian and, and have lunch with him and, and pick his brain. And uh, it pretty much exploded everything that I thought that I knew about pain and about musculoskeletal injuries and about what a skilled clinician looked like and, and what goes into somebody's experience of pain. And it was, it was at that point that I got really uncomfortable and I pretty much forced myself down the road of just taking more and more courses and more and more courses. And, um, I, I became a lurker on, um, Soma Simple, which is a discussion board that a lot of people are really familiar with, where uh, some some of the great minds in our profession have have gone to discuss a lot of really complex topics. And I was a lurker for a long time, and I was a lurker on uh, Facebook discussions with the likes of Jason Silvernell and Ben Cormack and Greg Lehman and Sandy Hilton and and John Ware and Barrett Dorco and all of these people that are just incredibly intelligent that really gave me insight into critical thinking and really humbled me to be able to watch them from afar. And I finally, you know, gained the confidence to, to enter into discussion with some of these people and, and, and put my ideas out there for critiquing and, and, uh, learned to be okay with constructive criticism. And through that was lucky enough to, to have Jason Silvernell agree to help me and, and, and mentor me a little bit from a distance, which really helped with my critical thinking and kind of led me down this pathway, just down the rabbit hole, reading as much as I could about pain and the human experience and, and reading as much research as I could about manual therapy and exercise and what it is that we do, which kind of led me down the pathway to finding Mark and hooking up with Mark and, and uh, joining in with the, the Modern Pain Care crew. Fantastic, guys. And, you know, one thing I want to touch on this a little bit, because one prevailing similarity that's, of course, noted throughout your guys' stories, but of course, I've heard this from a lot of other clinicians as well, is that taking a lot, a lot of CEUs and going down so many different schools of thought, and then really, we kind of get into this issue of so many different methods. And of course, there are some issues that that can kind of expand to. So what would you guys recommend to a newer clinician right now who's kind of just graduated and feels like they absolutely have no idea what they're doing and wants to navigate that a little bit more, how would you recommend that they proceed to actually really kind of stay the most eclectic and open, but not go too far down one method? I guess I would recommend, you know, and, and this comes from, you know, another one of Jared's mentors, Jason Silvernails, but Jason Silvernail, as far as develop a process and don't get so caught up in the products as far as like tools are great. I'm not saying there's there anything wrong with them, but Tools without a process of when to apply, to who to apply, at what time to apply, that's what, you know, clinical reasoning and clinical, you know, critical thinking are about. So I would really focus my efforts on developing a good process, a good process to kind of think and reason yourself through a patient case. Um, you know, there's different uh, programs that do it. I've just, my experience has been McKenzie and Maitland, and I think they both are, are good models of, of patient response and clinical reasoning around what you're doing. Definitely others out there, but I think, you know, the, the big thing is develop a process that doesn't require any specific letters after your name or it doesn't require any specific titled techniques or anything like that. Um, develop a process that's independent of that stuff because at the moment you put letters after your name and I'm, trust me, I'm a person who's got letters from various certifications. I think you, you open yourself up to bias. So just be okay. You know, if you get letters, great, but don't get married to them and just be able to critically analyze what you're doing at all times, regardless of who taught it to you, when they taught it to you, and just be true to the science and the art of what we do and recognize it's gray and you got to be comfortable being uncomfortable because that's the clinical world. But a process helps you navigate that without feeling too stuck in the, in the mud with a, a lot of what we see in the clinic. Uh, you know, I was just going to echo what, what Mark said. And uh, I was just going to say that being a little bit less removed from being a new grad, no offense, Mark, I, I still, I still remember that feeling intimately of, uh, of seeking what you feel like you're missing and every fiber of your being as a new grad, especially is going to be looking for the answer because you're going to, you're going to feel incompetent in clinic. And that's not because you are incompetent. It's just because clinical practice is so incredibly difficult and patients are so incredibly unique. And they're not going to look like that textbook that you had, and they're not going to respond like your instructor said in that textbook case. And they're not going to ex respond like that, 
manipulation guru taught you in that one weekend course. And, and that's when things get really uncomfortable. So I would, to echo Mark, really strongly recommend trying to find coursework in your first year out of school that helps you learn how to think and not what to think. Learns you how, helps you learn how to reflect on your own practice, helps you um, learn uh, what are common fallacies in the way that we think and common errors in our own reasoning. So you can be a little bit better at having that metacognition that Mark talked about earlier that will actually help you to become a really skilled clinician. I love what you guys are saying about critical thinking and how you've challenged yourselves throughout your career to do this. You know, one of the things we've heard on this show is that something that is maybe not as good with some PT schools is developing critical thinking in physical therapy students. Can you comment on that, what your personal experiences are with that, any students that you've taught and how we can maybe improve this in school? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, you know, clinical reasoning, it, it, you know, it's one of those things that you almost have to, like on a clinical level, it's like it's hard to teach that in university, in an academic setting where you're kind of divorced from patients to an extent. I know some universities do a better job at bringing in, you know, live patients and, and kind of helping see a thinking process. But I think we need to leverage technology in universities where you can virtual, like we're looking and exploring at Midwestern University where I uh, am a clinical faculty of how can we like do a live examination and then beam it to uh, across campus to our students so they can see it and then we can reflect on some of the decision making and stuff. I think there needs to be more formal coursework, Just, but how do you fit that into an already bloated curricular requirements? And obviously we don't need to put any more uh, financial load on our students these days. So. Um, I do think it needs to be imbibed into each cl class and each, whether you're a neuroclinician, acute care, or ortho or sports, um, some of those thinking processes. And I think the more students can see it real time with patients, and I think you're limited a bit, like I said, academically, but if you can get, and you know, it's, there's variability of what students are going to see in clinic with clinical instructors and things, but at, at least something that they can take into the clinic with some reasoning per processes. I know there's a lot of hypothetical deductive models out there that students get taught in school that they can take in the clinic and at least have some ways. But I think we got to do a better job educating our current clinicians to model it better to our students as well. So, I mean, I think it's a two-pronged thing, uh, both academically and post-professionally. Yeah. If, if I was going to follow up on that, I, I agree with Mark that it, it is difficult within the academic setting to really drive home a lot of clinical reasoning. But what I don't think is out of the realm of possibility is critical thinking. One of the things that has uh, just dramatically changed the way that I look at my own likelihood of creating error, that I look at my own um, strength with which I hold to beliefs and, and has made me a little bit more humble and, and likely to change my opinions in the, in the face of new and stronger in evidence is just learning about critical thinking, learning about how prone humans are to making mistakes in the way that we think and how prone we are to falling prey to our own biases. And these are things, all these logical fallacies and all of these, uh, you know, perceptual biases that we have in everything that we do and the way that we're impacted by social constructs and cultural constructs and the way that we're um, impacted by our own histories and beliefs just being aware of these things has, I feel like, been one of the most powerful things in actually allow, allowing me to move forward as a clinician because it, it has allowed me to not hold so tightly to those things that, that I thought were the answer before. Yeah, I think you guys make good points on that. And, you know, this is something we've discussed in our show many times. Uh, so let's just change gears here for a little bit. Tell us a little bit about how this whole modern pain care uh, business, uh, continuing education business got created. I'm really curious as to how you were able to set this up. Yeah, well, it was uh, due to just kind of having frustrations. I, again, I've been very grateful and privileged to work with Evidence in Motion and ISPI and just had a point in my career where I wanted to be able to teach the material the way I wanted to teach it, the medium I wanted to teach. I don't expect to walk in the ISPI and, and demand change. I haven't earned anything or anything. So I, I felt like, Hey, I have the opportunity to, um, you know, do my own thing. So it literally started, uh, one day with, uh, 
some colleagues just talking about it and decided to start it. And, and basically out of the goal of there, I thought there was better ways we could start helping kind of what Jared said, how do you incorporate critical thinking and clinical reasoning on the front end instead of it being kind of, here's all your techniques and your tools. And oh, here we'll add a little reasoning on the back end. Why don't we flip that on its head and say, Hey, learn how to think and reason with modern science and pain science involved. And then let's bring techniques and stuff in instead of it being so technical on the front end. So that was kind of where the um, coursework, I've been privileged. I had, I've had Corey Blickenstaff come on and teach for us. He teaches a, a great course, uh, a novel movement and edge work technique, which is kind of based on exposure based therapies, among other things. Um, we had recently had Mark Powers and Rod Henderson come on board. They have a, a great exercise course to kind of incorporate modern thinking and reasoning around exercise. Um, Jared and I teach a practical pain science course. We also have Marcos Lopez, who's another sharp uh, up and coming clinician who's joined us. He helps us in our mentorship, but he also, him and Jared uh, have an applying pain science course. Um, so, you know, we're just the companies slowly and steadily, we're just trying to share good content with the profession and hopefully move the profession forward. Um, hopefully have a platform that we're creating where clinicians can come and, and learn and be okay to be, we can criticize each other in a very professional format and the rejecting the whole guru based ways of the past and uh, just trying to move things forward. Yeah. And just out of curiosity, who would you guys say should pursue this mentorship program? Who's a good fit? You know, I, th I think that that's a really good question. And um, I think that that answer is probably still evolving right now. Um, but to give a little insight into who we've had in the program thus far, you know, we've had um, lots of physical therapists and physios um, from the United States, from Canada, from uh, different places in the UK. We've had several chiropractors. We've had some myotherapists from Australia. We have had uh, as well as some PTAs and uh, OTs and a, a, a couple of osteopaths as well from Brazil and uh, the Philippines, I believe. So anybody that is spending the vast majority of their time working with people who's at least one of their primary complaints is pain and especially musculoskeletal pain, uh, we feel we've designed and in the patients that we bring in for that in-depth intimate patient experience and in the you know the the content experts that we're bringing in on different things like uh, motivational interviewing and acceptance and commitment therapies and exposure-based therapies and opioid uh, use and abuse and disorders and that sort of thing uh, really builds a program that is going to help any of those clinicians that feel a little bit uncomfortable or unsure about that, what is the most up-to-date evidence around the science of pain saying, what are, you know, different world experts around the world saying as far as how we need to go about um, addressing these people in clinic or, or getting information from them or building a relationship with them. I feel like anybody that fits that demographic or, or clinical approach is who this program is kind of designed for. Yeah, to, to kind of piggyback off of that, I think what we tend to see is like two groups. It's the early career to, to even student about to be early career clinician who's just trying to figure out how do I incorporate this stuff into my practice. I, I it's it, you know I'm not getting a lot of it in school, um, yet I'm reading all this stuff on social media. I'm seeing. I mean, how do I get this? I mean, Jared's established uh, quite a big following in his you know social media networks, and we're working hard on that in our groups as well. Um, but we also see a lot of veteran clinicians who are like, you know, I kind of at that point that I spoke about in my career where it's just like, this isn't working the way that I thought it was, or it's just not as black and white. And, you know, they're seeing the same kind of push for pain science and, um, you know, modern science being incorporated into practice and critical thinking and such, and just want some ways to kind of, to bring that in. So we've had, you know, a definite spectrum of folks that uh, it's, which has been a great part of the experience. You get to the, see some veteran clinicians really sharing some of their failures and struggles, which I think helps some of the new grads who, you know, don't want to fail. They think it's all about being, you know, perfect in clinic, which, you know, the clinic is just not a place where that's really a realistic expectation. You know, we do our best, of course, but yeah. So, I mean, we see, you know, a, a different demographic, you know, pre across the spectrum, but like Jared said, if you're seeing pain as a primary complaint, then usually this would be a good fit for you. Yeah. I think it, I think it's some, 
really cool that we've been able to have a handful of, of fellowship trained clinicians come through the program as well. So it, it is truly people of all uh, backgrounds and trainings and, and levels of experience. And some of those fellowship trained clinicians have, have given us feedback that this was a really refreshing and helpful approach for them because it, it allowed them to take all of the training and all of the experience and all of the mentorship that they've had. And as Jason Silvernell would say, cross the chasm a little bit to start utilizing their skills and, and their, their manual handling and, and that sort of stuff to, to a better uh, degree. Yeah. And you guys had both kind of mentioned a little bit about kind of what this mentorship specifically entails from a content standpoint, of course, diving more into pain, reasoning, critical thinking, and all those other avenues. But let's talk a little bit more specifics here, because I realize that some people might be listening on that potentially want to look into this a little bit more. So how does this actually all happen? Like from how many sessions is it? What's the structure? How often is it? How long is it? Uh, how much does it cost? Like just to kind of get into like what someone should expect about this kind of a program. Yeah, right now it's a four month program. It's a program that's kind of uh, molding and melding just because we're, we're really trying to respond to students and what they're finding valuable. If we're, if they're, if we're getting feedback that there's any holes in content, we're filling in with content experts, but our current uh, framework is it's a four month program where it's three weeks on one week off. So we're giving people it's four months. We recognize is a long time, but, so we want to give people a week off to kind of decompress and catch up because apparently there's life outside of virtual mentorship with oftentimes full-time work and families and such. Um, so we want to give people the ability to succeed in those realms. But uh, for the three weeks on, one week off, we have like four modules that go into everything from the foundational pain knowledge to the communication uh, components to the uh, treatment. And then we have all kinds of different uh, modules that really kind of go through the breadth of, you know, what – you know, I ask and other groups have determined as kind of a comprehensive look at pain and in, in clinical practice. Um, we have two mentor calls where we have uh, Marcos, Jared, or I, and this go around, we go one-on-one, -on -one, which is one of the things we want to do is sometimes you take these certifications and things and you get like one weekend to like fight for the attention with 30 other people on with a, with a high level clinician. So we wanted to give people a one-on-one -on -one opportunity to get some direct mentoring, identifying where their struggles are, developing specific plans, helping them with the resources they need to kind of sharpen their skills and their practice. Um, that's again, uniquely tailored to them. Um, and then we have, you know, different, you know, resources along the way. We have guide guides and checklists just to give them some reasoning frameworks to kind of use within their subjective interview from their, uh, Jared's been kind enough to share his sticks and stones book with the groups who come in. We have, uh, our, we have an objective examination kind of reasoning framework and then pain neuroscience uh, framework and education framework. So just some different things without getting it too, we like to give folks the, the freedom to be their own clinician and, and recognize that they're, we're all unique human beings that might communicate in different ways, but there's ideally a framework that you can take all this massive amount of information and get it into some sort of uh, applicable practical thing that you can use in clinic without feeling like you're drowning and, you know, more blog posts and research articles and such. Mark, one quick follow-up. How much How much was the program again for the four months? Uh, right now, the cost is going to be $14.97. Um, and uh, four months, it's CEU approved. So it's uh, right now in Arizona, it's approved for, I believe, it's either 24.5 or 29. I, I can always, my dyslexia ruins me once in a while with that. But it's it's CEU approved. So folks come out with the CEUs. And uh, yeah, so that, that's currently where we're at. So from what you guys have learned through mentoring clinicians uh, with this initiative and from talking with so many others, what are some of the biggest trends that you're noticing that the majority of the clinicians maybe have the most difficulty with? And what are some optimal solutions for these trends? Well, yeah, yeah. Um, some of the big things that I think that have uh, jumped out to me so far, and this is this is something that honestly just occurred to me yesterday morning as I was having one of one of, one of the mentor calls, one of the one-on-one, -on -one, one hour mentor calls that we do, is that a lot of people that are in this mentorship thus far have been pretty skilled clinicians and they've been pretty up to date and pretty aware of a lot of the the modern pain science, but what they don't have is a network of people that they can interact with and a network of people that they can bounce ideas off of and get confirmation that they're going the right direction, that they are doing the right things in clinic, uh, 
that other people are experiencing some of the same struggles as them or seeing, uh, you know, some of the same uh, issues that are, you know, iatrogenically embedded into people from the medical system and that sort of thing and, and learning ways from a, from a large group of clinicians that are, um, have a similar mindset. Uh, of how to address those difficult situations and what, what have you done in the past that has been successful for you or what have you done in the past that wasn't successful for you? So one of the things that I've noticed by and large part is that being a part of a group like this is honestly comforting to some degree to know that there are other like-minded people and people having the same struggles as you and that we're all working together to try to make the healthcare system better and to try to better serve our patients because it can be really easy to feel like you're on an island by yourself somewhere um, and, and really isolated if you're trying to stay up on whatever the best science is. So that that's one of the things that I'm noticing is really beneficial about the program and I'm getting feedback that, that people enjoy a lot about it. But as far as, far as struggles go, um, I see a lot of people uh, – really thinking pain science is some sort of intervention that we apply at people and they kind of want to know more about what is this pain science and how do I pain science people without recognizing that pain science is, is simply just the science of pain. And what we're trying to do in the mentorship is help you better understand what that science is at least saying right now and change your entire practice pattern in the way that you think about and interact with people rather than teaching how to, you know, quote unquote, pain science at somebody. So I see a lot of people that really um, still have that mentality of wanting to be an operator instead of an interactor. See, it sounds like we're talking a lot about Jason Silvernow on this, <laughs> this podcast, but um, breaking away from that, that operator mindset is something that I see myself and everybody in the mentorship continue to struggle with. And we're just all encouraging each other to continue to stay in the interactor mindset and try not to operate upon people and try not to be a fixer, but instead try to be a facilitator of self-efficacy and a facilitator of uh, taking control of their own health and, and helping them regain function without necessarily always, uh, focusing 100% on, on fixing them or fixing their pain. Yeah, I think it's a kind of, I would definitely agree with what Jared said there. I think the other piece that, uh, you know, we miss, and this is, I can definitely say this was me when I was kind of, you know, we have this like psycho disabilities class, at least that was what I was called in my, and you kind of brush through that because I want to be the sports guy or the manual guy like Jared was talking about, but you, you miss the human side of that pain experience and the humanity aspect of it, which I think has been a huge unfortunate thing that we've missed, especially when we recognize psychosocial issues and things have so much more predictive ability than all the mechanics and kinesio kinesiology and things that, um, again, aren't completely worthless, but definitely I think we need to put them in a, in their perspective when it comes to um, the human pain experience. I think they've been maybe overweighed in, in the grand scheme of how we kind of look at people in pain. So just that, that ability to sit in front of a suffering human being and to be able to just look in the eye and communicate well with them. That's a struggle for a lot of people. They don't, you know, it's, it's, I remember when I first patient cried in my treatment room and I would default to like, okay, let's just tuck tail and run away and let's talk about your, well, uh, you know, how much do you sit per day? Or, you know, you just kind of, I never know how to deal with that. The emotions that come out in the, the treatment room and, and different things. So, Communication is a big hole that I think, you know, how do you communicate this stuff to people? How do you validate the experience that somebody comes in your treatment room with? How do you validate and then maybe give them some, you know, you know, permission to move and permission to, to kind of think a little bit differently? Because they've been oftentimes, like Jared said, a lot of iatrogenic messages and things pumped into them that really take some time to kind of, and it's not everybody's ready for it. I mean, not everybody's going to respond to a new narrative. You have to, how do you learn how to interact with a person who's not there yet and still try to have a constructive interaction with them that might move them there in five sessions, six sessions, maybe in a year or two, maybe you plant some seeds, but um, yeah. So the, the communication humanity piece, I think are other struggles that a lot of clinicians, including, you know, it's a developing skill for me, but we just had Bronnie Thompson, who's an amazing clinician, uh, OT PhD over in New Zealand came on and talked about motivational interviewing and acceptance and commitment therapy. I, I learned, Every time I hear folks like Bronnie and we had Gillette Belton as a patient came in and lectured to the crew, 
Um, we're big on the patient voice being a huge thing that should never be lost in clinical education and post-professional education and in PT education. I think we, we spend too much time trying to make decisions of what patients should do, how they should think and how they should behave with ever at, with never freaking asking them, which is, you know, probably my biggest passion of how, why I do some of the stuff I do in my podcast and, and bring in the patient voice to our conference that we're going to do later this year. So, um, yeah, I think that that human piece is, is the part that I think we can do a lot better with and, and is a struggle for most of us. Yeah, I think you make a really good point, Mark, that, you know, most of what we do, yeah, we help people get better, but most of what we do is listen. And, you know, healing is not just physical, but also mental and emotional. You know, we've been talking a lot about kind of how your program helps clinicians learn these these strategies. How do you track outcomes from your mentees? What types of uh, outcome measures do you utilize to track people's progress through and beyond the mentorship program? Yeah, so we don't have any like formal like photos or anything, but that's definitely something we've talked about is like seeing like and hopefully doing some maybe research in the future uh, as we kind of get the, the mentorship up and running full steam of looking at different uh, pre and post uh, outcomes. But what we do right now is we have like subjective examination worksheets where we uh, they have to go through and kind of, it's almost like an audit form where they kind of go through, do a subjective examination. They reflect on it um, and have to like, you know, go through these different reasoning steps to, um, you know, talk about what, what, what are the, what, what are you hearing as far as possible central sensitization cues? What are you hearing as possible family contributors? What are you hearing as per possible workplace contributors? So it hopefully cues them to start sharpening and broadening their thought process and their questioning methods in the subjective interview. We have the same kind of things for our examinations and our treatments as far as that they have to fill out a reasoning form um, and kind of, you know, validate what they're doing as, as far as that they have a thinking process that they're, they're using through it, that they're not just doing the, what I did early in my career is just throw interventions at the wall and see what one stuck and have no clue which one did any good. If they were better, great. If not, I have no clue either way. So, um, and then uh, we have people put it all together at the end where they kind of submit a one final case where it's all kind of clinically reasoned and thought, but we have some frame, a framework that we kind of take people through with some, uh, like I said, some audit forms of, of those processes to help people kind of navigate, navigate it and show that they're actually applying it, not just uh, listening to videos and, or, and listen to us lecture on um, uh, Wednesday nights and that they're actually applying it to real patients. Yeah, and I, w I wouldn't say that this obviously isn't a, a, an objective measure, but we also have an initiative in our in our private Facebook group that is kind of the wins initiative. And every time a, a person in the in the cohort applies something or a new thought process or a new approach to one of the patients that they have that maybe they're struggling with or that they felt like they wouldn't have known what to do in the with in the past because there was a lot of, um, you know, potentially psychosocial factors going on that they felt uncomfortable addressing or they didn't know how to navigate that, that situation. We strongly encourage them and have them write down that scenario in the group for everybody to see as a win. Like, Hey, I, I addressed this patient in a way that I would have never done before. And it opened up this entire uh, window into helping them get better and reaching a different level of care and, and focus on their treatment that I would have glossed right over before. So we're kind of keeping track of individual clinicians wins from as they kind of cross that chasm and, and, and go towards interacting with patients in a different manner. I really like that positive reinforcement piece at the end that you just mentioned, Jared. I think that's a really good thing to add. And you guys had both mentioned a few of these things earlier with Mark mentioning some things to improve from a content standpoint and, of course, looking more into potentially some research down the road. But And, of course, I realize that this program is still very early on in its process. But apart from what you guys have said, what other areas have you looked to – think about or have considered improving or making a changes to, to make this maybe more effective? You know, we're always looking at ways to make it more effective. Um, I, you know, I think really soliciting feedback from, you know, the, the folks going through it and making it seem what's really finding what they're finding value in and what they're maybe not finding as much value in and, and being flexible to change, you know, pretty rapidly. Um, but, uh, you know, I'd love to pack more in. I think it's tough to kind of, you know, Four, four months is you think is a long time, but there's just a lot of information. But I think, you know, trying to 
keep research and really have a process that is, doesn't allow the program to stay stagnant as far as letting research pass it by. So I'm always having that on the forefront. Uh, definitely looking at keeping the patient voice and having, uh, we had Amy Eicher, who's a PTA who went through a program, but also was a chronic pain patient who shared her story. And we have a lot of that stuff that goes on through the group. So, um, you know, I, I, I just the critical thinking and then, you know, some of the research, you know, critical an analysis or research a little bit to give people some understandings of, you know, to be buyer beware and just make sure they have some strategies to, to, to levy constructive criticism on some things without getting too uh, narrowed into some of the abstract based views of research and looking a little bit more deeply into it. There's a lot of things, but uh, you know, I think the big things that staying true to making it being all about the patient on the forefront and making sure we're doing our best by them by incorporating the best science we can incorporate and be a human being in front of them um, and uh, respect their values and validate their experience and hopefully move them forward. Yeah. I would, I would add, you know, as far as the program goes, it's, uh, it's really fluid with the way that Mark and I look at it right now. And if you look at our first running of the cohort to the second running of the cohort, we are very willing and we want to make changes to make this the best experience possible because this isn't about just getting a bunch of mentees to go through a program so we can, you know, have them signed up into the, with the modern pain care stamp on their forehead and, you know, whatever, you know, the first cohort was 12 weeks and they gave us the feedback that, man, this was, uh, this was too intense. It was too jam packed together. So we immediately turned around and made it 16 weeks and put in an off week every single week. And one of the other feedback, uh, pieces that we got was the the reading was a little bit too much. You guys, you you wanted us to read all of this awesome stuff, but we just didn't have time. So uh, Mark and I and Marcos decided to take all of the readings from every week and condense those down into a fifteen to twenty minute uh, you know video recorded lecture. They have all the readings, they have everything that they can read themselves, but we've also given them the spark notes because we understand that some weeks get a little bit busy and you might not be able to get to the reading that week. And you know, we want we heard that we wanted that uh, mentees wanted more about the patient voice. So now we've got uh, two weeks dedicated solely to hearing the or three weeks actually dedicated solely to hearing the patient perspective and they're from uh, really um, well-spoken and very highly educated and, and reflective uh, patients with Joletta Belton and Amy Eicher. And we still have our third one yet to come, which is a, a previous patient of Marcos that has history being a, a counselor herself who, who struggled through um, opioid use disorder. And she's going to give us that, that perspective as well. So all of the feedback that we get we're not just crumpling it up and throwing away, throwing it away. We're trying to redesign the program constantly to meet what everybody in the mentorship is saying would make it the best possible program for them. Yeah, that's awesome, you guys. Um, do you each believe that entry-level DPT and post-professional residency or fellowship does an optimal job at covering a biopsychosocial framework that prepares their students to treat with an evidence-based framework? in order to best serve our patients, or is that something that we need to work on a little bit? I think, you know, with the House of Delegates passing that motion this year to really force us as uh, educators to incorporate the International Association for Study of Pain's curricular recommendations into, now obviously that's going to take time to go through the necessary channels and make it to CAPT to accreditation. So I hope that's a good impetus for uh, universities to start incorporating it. Of course, I think we can do better and that's probably my bias of really nerding out into this stuff deeply and uh, I'm privileged where I get to go lecture uh, university students regularly on the topic and uh, teach electives and, and do things to hopefully um, push them and I, it's been such eaten up stuff from students because they get out in clinic for those clinicals and they're feeling lost as heck and I just I you know I've, we've all been there with the person who's crying or angry or whose body charts colored from head to toe and like that is nothing I saw on the body charts from these nice and neat uh, tissue driven things. So I think, you know, in the entry level, it's improving. It's on its way. I think we still need to do better and we can't be content. And, you know, I'd, I'd love to see the abilities to go from motion on the House of Delegates floor to en enacted in the classroom and actually research to motion on the House of Delegates floor to in action, in action into a classroom be a lot shorter than it is, but we know that takes time. But post-professionally, I think that's one of my big passions is how do we help 
people do a better job on the biopsychosocial model and not be so where it's just, um, you know, here's your technical side of the craft. Here's your, all your manual therapy or your, your sports techniques or whatever. Let's give people clinical thinking and critical, you know, critical th- uh, thinking and clinical reasoning on the front end, a good base of science and um, understanding, you know, the science of the craft we're doing. And then techniques come in. And I think it just makes it so much less. And then, again, the whole communication piece that I spoke to, I think that's a huge piece that's missing. Um, and I'm not sure we have the vehicle right now. We're trying to create a vehicle that it, I would, I, and I love fellowship training, but right now I think when you focus it on fellowship and manual therapy, I think you, I think unfortunately narrow it into a, a, a thought process that while it can be valuable, I'm not saying it's by any means bad. I just think it's, it's not the current vehicle. I think that best supports, um, what I would call a complete clinician. I think manual therapy has its place, but I think it should be kind of a, you know, here's an option for your patients because not every patient's ready for or wants manual therapy. But uh, um, I think we can do better by creating a complete clinician who can think and reason on their feet and then take different tools without getting too biased towards being a manual therapist or a whatever therapist and being about a, I'm a person therapist. I'm a getting a human being living better and moving better in their life therapist. And whether it's a manual therapy technique or a needle or exercise, whatever it takes to help a person get there. Um, I think we, those arguments I think are, and I've been a part of those arguments. So I'll, I'll confess to you. I think they kind of lose the mark on where we need to move. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't think I have uh, much to add to that. Mark, Mark pretty much covered uh, pretty much everything. Uh, I mean, it, I would just, I would agree that I don't think that we're there yet, but we are getting there. You know, change never happens as fast as we want it to, but there are very clearly a lot of, bright and motivated individuals trying to make some really awesome changes within the profession. And, you know, I see things going the right way and I'm, I'm somebody that, you know, of course I I want that instant gratification. I want uh, everybody to be speaking the same language and working together in a, in a unified manner to better help patients. And, and I think that that's the way that healthcare is going. I think that that's the way that, our curriculums are being structured, but uh, change is slow when there's accrediting bodies and when there's um, things like that to to attend to. So I think that we just have to be patient and continue plugging away in that direction. I definitely think you are right on that, Jared. It does take a long time for organizations to change. And um, you guys have done a really good job implementing some of these changes relatively quickly with your course you know, or your mentorship program. So I know that you guys also do offer a few other online courses and live courses through um, your organization. Um, Would you kind of give us some light, shed some light on what courses you offer through Modern Pain Care? Sure, yeah. Um, Like you said, Mark Powers and Rod Henderson have their kind of science-informed use of uh, therapeutic exercise. So again, they really lay out a good thinking and reasoning process of how to apply exercise uh, amongst clients we see in uh, PT. And then we have Corey Blickenstaff who teaches uh, novel movements in edgework class, which is basically uh, a course that really is foundation foundations are on exposure-based therapies among uh, other things. Corey is one of the more brilliant thinkers and humble in not really and soft-spoken human beings he's on the pain science and sensibility podcast with sandy hilton um but uh, one of the more brilliant dudes that i was i'm always fired up to talk to Corey and and interact with Corey because he's just sharp and uh thinks i think ahead of our time um we have like i said marcos jared and i uh teaching we have a practical pain science course where it's basically a two-day weekend course so those are all all two-day weekend courses that we teach um, we're our mentorship, of course. And then there's uh, Corey Blickenstaff has a exposure based therapies online course that we currently have uh, going on right now. And then uh, there's definitely some other online courses that we're, we're trying to reach people who can't maybe come to a two week or two day course or can't go on to the mentorship. Our, our big thing is we just want to get this information out there. We want to give people uh, an, an opportunity to get it on board in their practice and, um, you know, hopefully, you know, whether it be an online medium, a, a mentorship medium or a live course, we're, we're happy to provide it. And there's always stuff in development that uh, we're, we're excited to kind of move forward with. Um, there's, there's discussions of other programs that uh, we're still not going to release yet, but exciting stuff that we're fired up about. 
Well, good. And I want to kind of come back because I know you guys had both mentioned this up and coming unique conference regarding the patient voice that has frankly not been done yet. So I'd like to kind of dive into that because that's something featuring both you guys along with some of other some few great people on there. And that's going to be taking place in the fall in Arizona. Would you both kind of talk a little bit more about what this conference is and because it's so unique? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the this conference is it's going to be, it's called the complete patient experience. And it was really born out of the idea that uh, we're all kind of getting sick of going to the same weekend course with the same instructor teaching the same guru stuff or whatever it is. And, and talking about how I fix patients and I do this and it's so easy. We, we wanted to break away from that and actually get four people together, multiple people together with a kind of unified mindset that puts the patient at the center of care and and approaches care through a very humanistic viewpoint. And we wanted to get patients involved in the conference as keynote speakers, as uh, people on panels, as people who are giving feedbacks and going through the conference with the groups of clinicians so they can constantly have that feedback. And, you know, we want... Our, our vision is to have uh, four different modules within the conference, and it's going to be a really intensive, uh, small group uh, setup. So we don't really want to call it a conference, and we don't really want to call it a weekend course because it's neither of these. It's it's um, intensive learning modules with your small group where you rotate through and learn about um some of the best ways to educate on, you know, our modern understanding of pain and, and how can we integrate manual therapy to help our patients in a, uh, a way that best reflects modern neuroscience and understands what manual therapy does and does not do. And, and how can we use exercise and activity and play to have fun with people and to break away from the over medicalization of, of therapeutic exercise and and kind of reframe the way that we look at movement and exercise and and then wrap that all together with the entire environmental experience you know from the from the second that a that a patient calls your office to the second that they leave and and bring in the component of the the patient experience and the, the environment experience that that Jerry Durham is so incredibly good at doing so i guess i didn't mention it but it's going to be uh mark ben cormack cherry durham and myself um kind of leading the the, the small modules with uh joletta belton and amy eicher bringing a huge component of the patient experience with with keynote uh talks from their experiences as both patients and those that have worked with a lot of other people that have persistent pain and, and kind of bridging that gap that so many of our weekend courses and conferences don't, don't actually ever touch on. Yeah. Just to kind of piggyback on that, I th- you know, the big thing is we want people to leave that weekend feeling like they got some serious things from the front to back of that patient episode. Like, like uh, Jared said, uh, Jared's going to help folks get from the first phone call contact of that clinic to the front desk interaction with that patient, to your billing staff's interaction with that patient, even after care is done. But how does that front desk and the administrative staff cue that clinician up for success when that, um, you know, knowing what that patient's valued goals and valued activities that they've lost due to pain are, so that clinician knows them before that patient even steps into their evaluation room. Um, there's just a lot of processes and stuff you can do to tighten up with that. But Jerry's obviously an expert beyond uh, compared to, to talk to those points and then, I'll speak on manual therapy and, and kind of just putting it in a science perspective. Jared's going to talk about uh, education, um, both from a pain neuroscience and just you know communication aspects. And then Ben will talk about his expertise in exercise and creating an environment for that. Um, it's going to be in Phoenix, uh, Arizona here in November 2nd and 3rd of this year. Um, uh, the complete patient, ex- it's completepatientexperience.com is the website of it if you want to check it out. Um, there's also a Facebook page, the com- uh, complete patient experience that you can, uh, like, and check out if you guys want to get more information on it, but it's going to, there'll be more details coming out as we speak. We're going to probably start doing, uh, the conference early bird rate here shortly. We still got to iron out a few details on all that, um, as far as pricing and all that good stuff, but, uh, um, we're excited for it. We're hoping this, this conference becomes something that becomes a yearly staple and people's schedule where they're like, man, I got to get to this because it's, 
uh, we plan on it being an experience that people come away kind of, you know, we hope to blow their socks off and that they're like, wow, man, that really, I got a ton of value out of that conference that I'm ready to start enacting tomorrow when I get back to clinic. Yeah, I, I think, I think it's important that, you know, we continue with that message and we want it to be a complete human experience. We want it, the conference is the complete patient experience, but we don't want the conference to just be over or the course to just be over at five o'clock when, when the bell rings, we want everybody to continue to go together afterwards to, uh, you know, one location and, and, um, interact with each other and socialize and reflect and, and discuss and have questions and have fun and, you know, essentially bring back that, that social mentality, bring back that, that aspect of play and human interaction that we want to bring into the clinic with our patients. We need to make sure that we're reflecting that ourselves and in the way that we, uh, you know, go about education and go about improving, improving ourselves. So we just want the feel of this to be so much different than I'm in a, I'm in a classroom learning information. We want it to be a really unique, social and bonding experience where we all learn together and we all work together with the patients there with us on, on becoming um, better clinicians and, and better human beings at interacting with each other. Yeah. And we'll put the show notes uh, links to the, the conference in the show notes for sure. But gentlemen, I can't thank you enough for your time and for coming on the show tonight. Uh, we'd like to ask each of our guests this final question. If you could change one aspect of healthcare education, PT or other healthcare provider related, which aspect would you change and how would you change it? I would add definitely more humanities into, um, I'm not, it's, this is going to be two things. So humanities and philosophy of science education, as far as people understanding that science isn't as clear as a randomized control trial might make it think. And there's a lot of topics such as causation and different things that we need to be Considering that, uh, I think we can do better, but just recognizing how do you uh, respect the, the, the thoughts, the beliefs, the culture, the humanity of the human in front of you and try to understand it and, and use it to your advantage to try to connect with it and try to move it forward to a, a, you know, a useful intersubjective space that you and that patient can move forward constructively with to a, to a better place for that patient. Um, but I think too often we, you know, uh, Gordon Waddell talks about we, patients are never going to be neat packages of anatomy and mechanics. They're suffering human beings and health could be much easier if they were simply easy packages of mechanics and anatomy. But healthcare demands that we understand suffering human beings. And we need to be better at doing that and better at communicating and understanding and, and validating the experience that these people come to our treatment rooms having you know, been through. And I think the humanity component of it is huge. Well, because Mark just so eloquently explained what my answer would have been, I guess I'll uh, take a detour. And if I was if I was to change something about the way that uh, medical education is delivered right now, I'd I'd really like to see a, a shift in a move more towards a a project based learning style of interaction. Because right now, everything that we do is so siloed. You know, in the traditional models of medicine, we have the biomedical model and we have biomedicine that treats the person just like uh, their body is a machine and, and everything that we do and everything that we think is about biology. And then we've moved forward to this biopsychosocial model of care, but we still have a tendency to put people in silos and treat their biology or treat their psychology or treat their social issues. And we don't recognize that um, we're still siloing people. And I, I would like to see a lot more project-based learning and project-based uh, discussion about how do we look at this entire person simultaneously? How do we explore every aspect of their life and who they are and how that's playing a role in this um, experience of pain or this experience of depression or this metabolic condition or whatever it is that they're they're suffering from how can we look at every aspect of this human simultaneously to uh, make the best uh, choices for how to help them get better so if, if I could see less siloing and more project based uh, you know all encompassing approaches to teaching and curriculum I think that that would just change the game. 
Awesome. I have loved this conversation. You guys have made some amazing points and we love this mentorship program that you guys have going. You know, I'm sure that there's going to be a ton more questions for you. So if our listeners want to ask you guys a question or reach out to you online, where can they reach you? You can reach, you know, Modern Painter has a page on uh, Facebook. We also have uh, at Modern Pain Care on Instagram. Um, I'm pretty active on that. You also can, can reach me at uh, on Facebook on my personal page, which is pretty much where I nerd out with my fellow PTs, also on Twitter, um, but also Mark at Modern Pain Care if you'd ever want to just reach out and uh, have a discussion or have any questions about what we're doing. I'm happy to uh, commiserate over email as well. And as far as, as, far as myself, I, I have my personal Facebook page, which is just Jared Hall. And I, I also have a, a professional Facebook page, which is Dr. Jared Hall, PT, DPT. I'm, I'm definitely more active on my, my personal page, but you can reach me through either of those and um, pretty active on Instagram as well. Try and try my best to put out a lot of uh, helpful, good information for people. And that's uh, at Dr. Jared Hall, DPT on Instagram. Well, perfect, guys. I want to add in one last little link there, too, because you guys both are involved with the Clinical Thinker podcast with Ben and also kind of put a link. We'll also put a link in there for the Modern Pain podcast as well. And, and I really recommend you guys, especially newer clinicians that are listening, if you want to kind of dive a little bit deeper into kind of what Jared and Mark were talking about, listen to their first episode on the Clinical Thinker because it really dives into that whole episode just really dives into that avenue a little bit more specifically and it's a great listen especially for the new clinician or the clinician who's kind of like i think we all have taken like so many ceus and still felt lost so <laughs> I, I highly recommend that so check that out in the show notes but gentlemen thanks so much for your time and efforts it's always a pleasure thanks for having us yeah i appreciate it Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients, as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. Anywhere Healthcare, a telehealth platform, is a simple, low cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps, when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. Thank you for attending class today. And we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET podcast on Instagram, HET podcast on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, healthcareeducationtransformationpodcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.